Hi everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. How are you doing tonight, Coco? I'm a little peeved that Google can't understand the difference between gem and gem. I know, right? I feel like it sounds completely different. And Google should have enough of a pop culture Rolodex to know that Gem in the Holograms was iconic in the 80s. It super was. And still is today, but not that movie that came out about it. That movie was shitty. God, that movie was awful. Yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Synergy was an electronic chia pet. Talk about, like, just an absolute bastardization of the source material. <laughs> Juliette Lewis, you should have known better better than to star in that. I know. And then they made all of the bad characters ethnic. And then all of the, the good fuck? characters white and ambiguously ethnic. Yeah. What, what, what in the world? I'm super happy that that Choices. movie got canceled. I've never seen anything worse than that since the live action Avatar The Last Airbender. Ooh. Or Tomb Raider 2. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're not talking about any of that today. We're not, we're not. But we just decided it would be a good uh, tangent to go off on because we have opinions. Yes, and we think that we're smart and intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> so today's episode, we're going to be talking about quarantine. No, I'm just joking. We've already done that. Yeah. We're, we're going to be talking about how in this new day and age, People, drag artists are having to constantly and considerably change what they do. Um, as you know, me and Donatella are drag artists. And we want to go back a little bit in our history. And I want to talk about how the skills of drag, like the this art form that we do. So one thing specifically, like way back when I started that I had to learn how to do was make mixes. I remember I was in the basement of some seedy bar in Denver and this person had performed this song upstairs that was so cool with all these like different songs together, like, you know, a cheerleading dance routine or something like that, where they mix songs together. And I was like, yeah, where did that come from? And she told me, and it was from this person. And I, so I was like, I looked them up and I got a commission and my song was like, I think it was like $70 mm -hmm. to get it commissioned. Uh, and um, they sent it to me with like this, um, watermark over it and whatever where it's yeah. in the person's name every three minutes and so and then then of course I paid for it and then I got the real thing after I loved my mix and whatever and mm -hmm. so that was the first time I ever commissioned a mix and I loved performing to mixes and I realized I have to learn how to do this myself I cannot perform in drag and I was only performing like once a month let time. alone like be paying for a mix every time you want to have something special oh gosh so, right and it's and it, it really is like once you look up how to do it it's an easy skill to learn it is. Out of, out of the skills that you have to do as a queen, it's one of the easier ones, you know? Um, perfecting it and getting timing down and all that stuff, like, that's definitely something that you have to work out over time. And, and especially if you're wanting to add some extra things like sound effects and all that, you know? Like, there's an art to it for sure. But it's one of those things that you have to kind of, like, learn to be a self-sufficient entertainer. It really, really is. Because nowadays, like, I make a hundred percent of all of my mixes um sometimes friends give me mixes that i'll perform to but i make the majority of all of my mixes because think about it like 70 bucks and i like in portland right now before the pandemic i used to perform about four to five times a week can you imagine having to and obviously two songs per show having to pay 70 dollars for every song and sometimes i repeat it but not often yeah. like i would have been broke yeah i would have been broke um, so Donna, one thing I've always been jealous of is your acting <laughs> ability in drag. Where did that come from? Um, I did a lot of theater. I did a lot of theater in high school and then community theater, uh, in high school and outside of high school and college. And so that, uh, that was kind of where I, I learned to act was, was my theater background. Like, I feel like most gay boys and, and drag queens have <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, you know, like I was, um, even though I was straight in high school, I did show choir and I still did theater and all that stuff. And, um, it was something that I just really loved. And I always learned that acting was reacting, you know, as, as they like to say. So, um, just kind of taking yourself and putting yourself in a moment and uh, reacting to uh, the context of what's happening in that moment and in that writing is something that always uh, intrigued me and a uh, craft that I always wanted to develop a little bit in myself. So, um, and then as far as just uh, creativity and like kind of like sketching outfits and stuff like that, that 
I have a bit of an art background too. I, I mean, my uh, major in college was like a bachelor in fine arts. So I, um, I did a lot of art in my first couple years of college. And then um, even towards my, my later years, um, I w it was a lot of video editing. It was a lot of working with um, editing sounds, um, just having sort of creative concepts designing. There was a bit of graphic design that I learned as well. Um, and so I really liked two-dimensional art and sketching and that's kind of when I got into sewing I like to sketch things up um, that I wanted to see on myself and on my drag persona so that was just another way that I got to use skills that I had learned previously and other facets into drag. Well when we think about it like especially for all the new um, drag entertainers who listen to us sometimes it's, it's okay to bring in the things that you already know. A lot of drag entertainers that I know were like cheerleaders. Like mm -hmm. some drag entertainers were male cheerleaders. Oh, yeah. And they brought that skill over and then obviously can choreograph routines. Like Kisses Ash, who's Diana Fire's drag daughter. Uh, she is an amazing dancer. And it's mm -hmm. all those cheer skills, definitely, that yeah. come out of nowhere. And she just owns the scene. The fact is, um, I, can, I, I can say this about myself. I'm actually not creative fashion-wise. Um, I'm one of those people who mimic, uh, and that's totally fine. If you see something that you know you can create and just choose your own fabric and colors, that's fine. That's not necessarily stealing someone else's art. Mm -hmm. If you steal somebody else's pattern, that's something. But um, make sure, like, you know, if you do take something from somebody, give them the credit on the internet, just as a side note. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think that goes for makeup, too. Like, if you're inspired by something, you know, yeah. it's, it, it, any kind of creative avenue and drag i think you can be inspired by other people's work yeah especially because most of us just don't learn right out of the box like um don't give credit to rupaul every time you try to paint like her that's not a thing but like mm -hmm. if there's like a local entertainer who you specifically copied like give that entertainer some credit and even more on that though drag is i feel a very referential art form so we're constantly pulling references a lot of it yeah. is reused ideas a lot of it's not original i mean we see these high fashion avant-garde looks that strut down runways and, you know, Vogue or something like that. And then you get inspiration from those little bits, you know, like when McQueen had his collection, drag queens were very inspired by that, you know, especially because of a lot of the outfits that Lady Gaga was wearing around the time were very McQueen and, you know, even right. by him at the time. So, yeah, um, yeah there's, there's always going to be references to pull from and inspirations. And um, that one is more, a little more for our generation, but throughout time as queens have performed, they've always pulled references from different artists and from each other. And um, it's just kind of the way that the art forms always existed. Yeah. And even with that, and more to that point too, is you'll notice that sometimes drag just seems like it's stuck in the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. from the way that we paint ourselves. Like we do definitely look like the later seasons of Charlie's Angels, like mm -hmm. the original series. <laughs> when you look at our makeup, it is not even a lie. Look at that season <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's drag. Okay. <laughs> Party. Shoulder pads. Um. Mm -hmm. And then the, the like neon bits of blush down the face <laughs> the from the neon. 80s. The 80s blush is very drag. It yeah. is very drag. Um, especially that cheek contour. Yeah. So the, the reason that we're talking about these specific subjects about our drag is because right now drag is going through this ever-changing mode where people are who do drag full time are trying to figure out how to still do drag, even with everything shut down. So obviously, as we said in our earlier episodes, a lot of people turn to live shows and that's how mm -hmm. they're doing it. Um, and what I want to say about that is it just literally added to the list of skills that drag entertainers already had to have. Mm -hmm. Like we we had to know. So let me preface this like. Some drag entertainers can commission things. Like we said before, you can't commission acting and performance per se. I mean, sure, you could pay for dance lessons, I guess. Yeah. But you you can commission hair. You can commission a costume. You can commission jewelry. You can commission shoes. You can commission pretty much everything you want in drag. However, um, and you can even commission this next thing I want to talk about. But now in this world, we literally have to also be video editors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um it's because of the new platforms that drag is having to exist on. So it's not only having like a well-realized uh, concept that you want to put together for it, but you're essentially making a like, you know, four to five minute music video about yourself anytime you do these live performances. So there's endless amounts of creativity 
And I think the more that we see it evolve as queens are doing more of these digital performances, we're seeing the caliber get raised on these performances. So it's, I mean, it's definitely put a lot of pressure on entertainers that are partaking in these digital shows to really um, step up their game and create something that um, really speaks to the world and speaks to them as an artist. And honestly, for me, it's gotten kind of exciting because I, it's a... Um, I found that this platform and this medium has made it to where I can be even more creative than I would have been during a live performance. So I'm very, my, my drag is very um, film referenced because I'm obsessed with like grindhouse cinema, femme fatales, um, film noir and all that. So allowing that to be put on this sort of platform is sort of exciting for me because it's not always translated on stage. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's not. And so I I honestly don't like it as much. But because here's the thing, like, it just requires a lot more effort. And I know that that sounds weird as an entertainer. You know, you, you work hard, you do it, you become famous, you know, put all your money into it, put all of your effort into it, put all of your knowledge into it. But the fact is, like, recording a performance is really difficult for me. I don't feel like I'm the best actor. I don't stay in character a thousand percent of the time. It... I guess the guess the best way for me to say it is I struggle. Mm -hmm. I struggle with it um, more so than I do with a live performance. And when I sing live, because I did a singing live performance, like that was good. I could do that. Um, I could record that because I'm not having to create this video masterpiece. And I think the audiences, because I did ask this online today, and I think people are being a little bit more um, kind. Mm -hmm. People are being very kind with the live shows to see how they're like freezing and how they have other kind of things that they're doing when it comes to it just not being good, like buffering or things like that. Yeah. And so people are being kind. Technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. And so that's just really just another layer that drag artists had to actually overcome. Um, while I'm on it, I forgot to ask this earlier, but uh, Donna, how are you doing tonight? You know what? I will let you know after this brief commercial break. Hey all you beauties, this is Manhattan Brown, Eugene's bearded lady, with a special message. Do you love podcasting queers, queer issues and themes? Well, check out Queer With Attitude on your podcast app for a new obsession that focuses on tearing down the societal norms in the LGBTQIA plus community with weekly guests, creative writing, and a special cocktail of the week designed by mixologist Brian Peterson. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and other podcasting apps, or you can check us out at anchor.fm backslash queer with attitude to see where to find us and to become a monthly sponsor. Join the queer revolution to educate, create, and inspire. You know, Coco, I was thinking about your question and I'm doing really great. I know that not everyone is super thriving during this time and everyone is a bit anxious about the state of the world, but I feel like this is a great time to learn new skills. And getting back to the topic that we're talking about, we're talking about skills that you develop as drag has changed um, with this new platform that we're on being digital. Yeah, so so even for on my end, so we are hosting a drag show called Desperation on May 30th, um, 2020. So for those of you who come back because we get so famous with this podcast, um, yes, you've missed it. <laughs> for those of you who are listening to it when it comes out, you have, you know, a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I had to learn different streaming platforms and what that looks like and mm -hmm. learn video editing rates. And I've actually put a lot of money out there too, to try to figure out how to get this stuff done. And the thing is, I, if you don't know, I have my master's degree in it. Um, that does not mean I'm automatically good at everything tech technological, but like it does give me a leg up. And then I use my roommates to help me test out this stuff and the other people on the show. So I had to learn that skill as well. And mm -hmm. I know people out there are probably, and here's a tip. I know people out there have been asking how to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be that person who's like, well, now I know how to do it. So I'm going to sell you my services. Mm -hmm. The fact is, like, I can guide you if you need the assistance on how to do this stuff. But like even right now, like we have recording software. We have um, full DJ equipment. 
We have a podcast mic. We have these things to make this show a little bit better. So when we do it, it will sound like really good quality. And so I guess my biggest suggestion for people out there who are listening to this for veterans and new people or anybody trying to do a live show is that the sound of what you're doing and the video rate of what you're doing is really important because you want people to enjoy what you're doing, not feel uncomfortable because there's so many technical difficulties. Well, and then also going back to what you were just saying. So you're, you're talking about these new skills that you've had to learn as you've been doing this. So you had to learn these new platforms to put shows out on. Um, this takes time to learn these things. And there are a wealth of resources out there for entertainers that are wanting to learn how to do this. Um, I talked about it before in a previous video when we were kind of in, I guess I would call it not only a literal high desert as far as its climate, but also a bit of a drag desert because we were learning from the few entertainers that we had in the area because we were not in a really big city. So YouTube is where we went to learn a lot of skills. You can learn a lot of skills from YouTube as far as video editing. For for me, especially, like I had a background of working with a bit of video editing and sound editing and all that because of my major in um, college. Now, anyone can learn what I learned in college off of YouTube. And they could learn it not only from YouTube, but the other resources out there. Like um, there's a whole like creator studio that you could do um, actually from Google that will like show you steps on how to make really cool videos. Um, there are all sorts of different online schools like Udemy that take that sh teach really cheap classes on how to do um, all of this stuff and more. And um, you can really grow as an editor and stuff. But that takes time and you always get the return that you're expecting from it as an entertainer. Yeah, it, it's true. You you don't always get the return you're expecting. Some people have been criticizing, have been critical of me and Donna for actually multiple years because of this. And along with that point, the fact of the matter is drag isn't cheap. Like as much as we want to pretend that it is, it's not. You can do as much as you can, but like even for people who are considered themselves garbage queens or even... Um, somebody who literally is thrift.com or mm -hmm. they're using stuff or they create stuff, eventually it will start costing money from your gas to get to the gig, from your gas to get home, to your pantyhose rips, to your eyelashes needing to buy new eyelashes. Like something will eventually start costing money for you. And you have to remember that these skills that you have don't necessarily always translate to dollars, like Donna said. Yeah. So, like, because even the live show... Um, stuff that I'm doing and even this podcast that we got the idea and have the skills to do it because of drag to when we DJ a show to when we put a costume together and most of the time which we said in an earlier episode but I want to reiterate for our new fans who aren't going to listen back most of the bookings that's actually decent for a non-tv entertainer is like fifty dollars yeah yeah, so there, I mean, there isn't a huge payoff from it, but that also means that you have to have a certain level of passion going into it as well. I mean, obviously we're not doing this for the money. No. We've been doing it this long. Yeah, I do drag because um, I love to entertain and I like, mm -hmm. that's what's also difficult. I like to entertain and I actually like tinkering and figuring things out. That's why the live show sounds mm -hmm. kind of fun, but... I like being in a crowd of people screaming my name. The bigger the show, the more excited I get. I like to entertain. I love getting paid to entertain. Yes. I love <laughs> getting paid to entertain. You know, so it's like, it's not like, and it's, it, here's the thing. It's not like we're doing this purely out of like, you know, greed for it. But at the same time, doesn't anyone want to get, wouldn't anyone love to get paid for what they love to do? Anybody. Yeah. And, and you know. some sort of compensation. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be monetarily. Like, um, Godiva Divine offers you jewelry because she makes jewelry. Mm -hmm. um, if you perform in a stag branch, well, back in the day, when you perform in a stag branch, she would give you jewelry um, mm -hmm. as kind of your booking. Yeah. And it's pageant-sized jewelry, and it's lightweight, and it's really nice. Yeah, which every every queen needs some, you know? Mm -hmm. every Every queen needs that for, you know, a look, whether... They're pageant queens or not it's good for an elegant look it's good it's a good drag staple to have so it is so it's it's actually a really good gift or yeah. a good trade yeah it's a good trade it's a good trade for for the yeah for what you're putting out there plus you get you still get the tips that you get to take home you too, do so. and, and that show has really has really really great tips so that's like a really good booking in that regard and i know some people out there because i know um 
what was that famous band? Not famous, but that locally known band in Junction that everybody went. Uh, what was it called? Well, whatever their name is, which I'll probably think of it here in a second. <laughs> um, they actually get paid like roughly like any time they touch the stage in Junction, they get paid like roughly a thousand dollars. Oh yeah, I can't remember their names, but I I also didn't go out and watch a whole lot of shows um, later when I was living in Junction. So yeah, so like. I bet they're probably, like, if they were listening to this, and like I say, we get paid $50. And actually, in Junction, we got paid zero. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to throw a show. Yeah. Um, which would have more people in it than sometimes they did. Like, yeah. yeah like, they get paid $1,000. And people always equate a drag artist to, if you're not carrying a musical instrument, you don't deserve the same amount of money. But you're putting in a shit ton of work. You know? Yeah. Like, that's the thing, is, like, people don't realize the effort that goes into this. And mm -hmm. so I think it is important for us to be talking about on this, the fact that, you know, there are even more skills that entertainers are having to learn. So when you see an entertainer putting out some content, support that content, you know? Like, yeah. really, really share, share what they're putting out there, um, whether it be, you know, like, a digital video performance or just show some love for it on social media love it when other people share it um you know just j give feedback too you know it's our job to build each other up during this time and if you see something that you really love that an entertainer's putting out there show them that love yeah yeah definitely and in more to that point too is it's not always going to be great but definitely yeah. show them some love because at least they're trying because we have to, some of us are full time. Yeah. So they have to put out content now and it might not be with the best camera or the best yeah. podcast mic or the best speakers or there's going to be technical difficulties and stuff like that. So just mm -hmm. be kind. Yeah, be definitely. Kind. And it's, it's kind of crazy because like the content market already was so saturated. I mean, already very competitive. And now that people have more time on their hands, we have more and more people that are kind of, um, putting stuff out there and you it's it's a bit oversaturated because everyone is trying to fight for this space um, yeah. so it's kind of interesting to see um how that is working because um that's what we have right now you know that's our platform right and so merging into like so moving forward in this conversation we want to talk about because we don't know none of us know right now as of may 6 2020 that what will happen when the venues start reopening and we wanted to talk about like some of our predictions yeah this is not based on anything other than just a gut feel mm -hmm. so take it with a grain of salt but i think it's also a really good conversation so i'll ask donna so what do you think it's going to be like when you know stay-at-home orders are ending and venues start to reopen well i think um there's going to be a certain number of challenges that we're going to face um, I feel like that's really fair to say. Um, these venues are trying to build up their clientele and they're trying to just make the bottom line, you know, with their business um, and, uh, and trying to make money. So I feel like it's going to be a lot of reevaluation. And so entertainers and shows that bring in money I think are going to be put to the forefront and um, even before that becomes a conversation though the businesses are going to have to focus on um, being stable because we have uncertain times ahead for us yeah and my prediction is that I don't think that drag I actually have this really chilling feeling that drag is going to change forever yeah my boss at my boy job would say before 9 11 and after 9 11 are very different things you know and i bet way back in the down day before the moon line moon landing and after the moon landing were very different things mm -hmm. um stuff like that and before and he also said before y2k and after y2k like the world just changed mm -hmm. and with this i also think that the united states is going to see a ref a really huge change and i think drag is going to drastically change because of it i think like to expect that there wouldn't be would be naive agreed i actually fully agree with that so my prediction when venues start reopening is obviously drag won't be the first and foremost thing that they're going to be thinking about mm -hmm. um sure a lot of drag artists think that well they're going to need you know to bring people in um i think they're going to try to figure out how to keep their liquor stocked at first and 
open the doors and evaluate if people even want to spend time in venues. Think about it. There might be people who used to go out who are not going anymore because, one, we've been at home for roughly two months now, right? Mm -hmm. So what if they picked up a new hobby? What if they quit drinking? Yeah. Like, because yeah. I don't actually drink as much as I used to because I've been at home. I haven't either, honestly. And I've, I've had time to focus on other things, which has been good. Mm -hmm. Um... It's, I mean, it's just kind of like what I was saying, segueing back into this, into part two of this episode. You have plenty of time. You have all the time to work on yourself and anything you ever wanted to work on now. Yeah. And so maybe the person who was the bar rat who, you know, paid hundreds of dollars every other day at the bar is now really enjoying their garden at home or yeah. picked up a great book or started writing or picked up another craft. And so I think that the bars aren't going to necessarily go back to immediately throwing drag shows because they want to see, they're going to see what the clientele is yeah. now like. Yeah, they're going to need to see that. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure that there will be, I mean, at the same time, I'm sure that there will be people that are just like galvanized and ready to go out and <laughs> get sloshed, you know? Right. Like, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I feel like that we're experiencing a bit of a collective culture shift yes. with what's happening now and it's going to be hard not to come out changed from this experience. I feel like the people who don't come out changed are going to get left in the dust and I'm worried about being one of those people. Mm -hmm. I haven't crafted a new costume. Um, I really do stick hard to my quarantine orders. Mm -hmm. I don't go shopping frivolously if I don't need to uh, just because I want to be safe. Mm -hmm. I have a lot to think about in my life and I just want to keep it safe. So I don't, I haven't bought new fabric. I have created new things. Like I created, you know, masks and whatever, mm -hmm. but I haven't done anything creative in that regard. But like, I really do feel my creative juices flowing, like with throwing this live show, mm -hmm. like trying to get that done. Cause I think I want to make the live show weekly if it, if it turns out to be great. Yeah. So that's just something to think about on that end. I think from my experience with it, I've um, I've had more time to be introspective and think about where I want my drag to go. Um, I think with the constant stream of shows, it was really hard to see that for me. So for me, I'm just embracing more of like my alternative drag that I've always loved and that I started out being. And so instead of constantly focusing on what gig is up next and what number I'm going to have to recycle for it, I have time to get creative. And I have time to really tune into what I want to achieve as an entertainer. And I think that's, that's a good, it's a good time for that as well. Yeah, I definitely think so. So the last thing I wanted to say about the, uh, about possibly venues reopening is that we might not see drag in the way that we used to for a very long time to come. Yeah. Um, we, me and Donatella, we lost a show mm -hmm. um, because of the, uh, because of quarantine, you know, they just didn't have the ability to keep that place open. So we lost a show. So that's going to be another time for us to reevaluate to see what we're going to do. So mm -hmm. for anybody, and let's just take a moment here. Anybody who did lose a show that, I'm absolutely sorry. That's just really heartbreaking, especially yeah. if it was something that you loved. Um, it's it's terrible and sad when venues close. Mm -hmm. You never wish anyone to fail. Anyone who's out of work, out coming out of this because the work that you, the business that you were working at failed. Um, we are sorry, and we can definitely, you know, just feel for you because it's it's rough when this sort of thing happens. And going back. Uh, from this experience with a certain degree of uncertainty um, is uh, is scary. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, so just a small note that we wanted to talk about is, <laughs> before we end our episode here, is we did want to say that everybody needs to be careful on the Pacific Northwest because of the murder hornets. Yes. Or as they're called. The Asian giant hornets or the Vespa Mandrinia. <laughs> Um, they're pretty much just big bees um, <laughs> that are decimating honeybee populations. And if you haven't like done some research um, into the importance of honeybees and um, their importance in our ecosystem, they pollinate. Um, I would I think it's over half of the food that we consume. So they're extremely important for food consumption. Um, and uh, yeah, they are basically encouraging people. Now, these these hornets. Um, the sting is supposed to feel like hot metal going through your flesh. Um, so that's settling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, they are encouraging people, though, if they, um, I mean, obviously don't get killed in the process, but they want these um, populations to basically be wiped out from 
North America because they are decimating these bee populations. So I don't know if there's um, animal control. If you do <laughs> see them, I don't know how far they've gotten into um, areas that are, are urban or um, that have more of like a cityscape. But um, yeah, if if just keep your eye out for them and also call animal control i don't i don't know i don't get, get a flamethrower um yeah maybe. something a flamethrower maybe some uh <laughs> i don't know what else throw yeah. some jet fuel on it i have no idea oh by the way they're called murder hornets because two of their stings and a human person can kill you yeah and especially if you're um especially if you are allergic already to hornets and, and bees um they one sting can kill you it's it's very you can be very sensitive to it um, and they kill about 50 people a year in China. So that's yeah. also why they... They're also a delicacy in China. Huh. A lot of a lot of bugs are. I watch... I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube the other night. Where, uh, I can't remember what it's called. The um, It's like somethingology, the, the um, practice of eating bugs. <laughs> um, and you know what? Like, the more I watched it, the more I'm like, who am I to judge them? You know? It's a source <laughs> of protein probably better for you than getting some of these processed meats that we all eat in the mm -hmm. u.s so yeah. you know like good for them they're getting their protein in and it's probably healthy protein so i mean i wouldn't knock it don't knock it till you try it don't knock it till you try it <laughs> yeah definitely okay so we are towards the end of our episode everybody be safe out there obviously murder hornets um, corona drag yeah. artists filming their live shows in the streets or yeah. something like that stay out of their way they might stomp all over you <laughs> but um yeah just be kind to the drag artists out there and to essential workers be kind to essential workers be so kind be so kind and respectful. Yes. So make sure to like and subscribe. Um, we do have our podcast almost now, I think, available anywhere you listen to podcasts. We're on Google Podcasts, yep. Podbean, Apple Podcasts. And you can YouTube. find um, exclusive content for our podcast at a gem of a secret podcast.com. That's a gem of a secret podcast.com. Yeah. And that concludes our episode for this week. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We look forward to. Uh, talking with you again on Thursday. Yeah, and please make sure to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. That really helps us out if you can get around to doing that. Absolutely. Thank you. Once again, I'm Coco Gem Holiday. And I'm Donna Telling My Secrets. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>